are welcome, friend and stranger, at the banquet of the Savior. All are welcome, all are welcome here. From the woman who comes crying, leaving tears at Jesus' feet, to the man who knows the right way, but cannot see. lesson comes from the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 10. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you might refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of Colossians the first chapter, verses 15 through 28. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, become a minister of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its minister according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the world of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel lesson is according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. The title of our message for this weekend is Welcome and Hospitality. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, sisters and brothers, I remember at my very first church in Alexandria, Pennsylvania, we had a woman named Frida who designate, designated herself as our official greeter. I will never forget her. She was this tiny lady, very skinny, um, who reminded me of a bird. Um, she wore dresses with these little twig legs sticking out and had this white hair and was very tiny and just reminded me of this little bird. Um, and she could not hear well, so she would almost shout and think that she was whispering and that other people could not hear her. And I loved Frida, however, she did not have gifts of welcome and hospitality, but she thought she did. <laughs> um, so when people would come to church, she would say very loudly, thinking she was whispering, that guy's coming to church? Oh my goodness, he hasn't been here in years. What's he doing coming to church? Lightning will strike the church if he walks inside. And thankfully, I could hear her, so I would run over and say, Frida, of course he's welcome. Welcome, brother. Everybody's welcome here. Come on in. It's so great to see you. Um, now, I contrast Frida with a woman here at First Lutheran Church uh, who now lives in the heavenly kingdom, but years ago, um, she also lives in my heart. I will never forget this woman. I think of her all the time. Her name is Mary Barney. And I asked Mary Barney to be our official greeter here at First Lutheran because Mary had this deep, deep gift of true welcome and hospitality. And she would always sit near the back and be on alert. She would keep a lookout for people who were new, who, who were coming here for the first time, and she would come right over to them and welcome them warmly and hand them a bulletin and make sure they knew how to follow our order of worship. And if they said something about feeling awkward because they were alone, she would offer to sit with them. And if they seemed okay, she would just be there if they needed her. But she just had this amazing gift of truly gracious welcome and hospitality. As many of you know, I leave for vacation in Europe um, this coming Monday. 
And one of my joys when I travel is to visit other churches. Um, but I hate to admit it, but when I travel and visit other churches, I cannot help but um, notice certain things. And I always am very aware um, as to whether I am welcomed and treated with gracious hospitality when I visit a church or whether I am not. That is of crucial importance. And so I invite us as a community of faith to, to really think about when new people come to us and to visit, um, do they feel a sense of warm and gracious welcome and hospitality or do they not? And I even have a challenge. If I as pastor um, run over to hand a new person, a visitor, a bulletin, a program, then that means that other members of the community have not been doing their job because it should not be the pastor uh, who runs over to welcome someone. It should be the people near the door, the people near the entrance of the church who are on alert, who are just looking for visitors to welcome. Um, today's readings, our first reading and our gospel lesson, are in fact about welcome and hospitality. And I can never hear the story of that first reading about Abraham and Sarah without thinking of a man named Rabbi David Flam who is from uh, the Hillel Center at Brown University, who came when I was at my previous church to our adult Bible study and told us how deeply important welcome and hospitality is in Middle Eastern culture, in biblical times, but still to this very day. And part of it has to do with the fact that it's a desert culture. Um, as travelers uh, are coming through the desert, if they are not given the gift of welcome and hospitality, it is a matter of life and death. They could die in the desert unless they are offered this gift of hospitality. The desert is a dangerous place to be traveling. But let's think of that metaphorically. Today, many people are kind of traveling through the desert of this world and have maybe an emotional desert. Maybe they're going through a very hard time. Maybe they're deeply grieving and they come to our, they enter our sanctuary. And there's a reason why we call it a sanctuary, right? They enter our sanctuary. And so we need to be sure that our sanctuary, our sacred place is a place of lavish, gracious welcome and hospitality. So Abraham today sets us a good example. It says that um, Abraham was sitting by the Oaks of Mamre, which if you read the footnotes in the book of Genesis, this was, these oak trees were sacred trees. I am wearing my tree of life stole. And in the Hebrew Bible and the book of Genesis, we hear of the tree of life. It's repeated um, in the vision uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, the vision of the heavenly kingdom where there is this tree of life. Um, in ancient Judaism, trees were sacred and people would go and sit beneath these trees. This was a sacred space. And they would pray and meditate to receive the wisdom from the trees, to receive the answer to their struggles, to their problems. So Abraham is sitting under these trees and these three men, these visitors come by and Abraham is a truly welcoming, gracious host with the gift of lavish 
hospitality. He invites them into, into his sacred space. He says, let me wash your feet, welcome. Uh, he prepares, he has his wife Sarah prepare cakes for them. He kills the, the unblemished fatted calf for them. He prepares curds and, and serves them this gracious feast. And at the end of the meal, these three visitors tell him, or one of the three tells him that when they return in a year, his wife, Sarah, will have a son. In the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, they tell us that without realizing it, Abraham was and Sarah were entertaining angels unaware that they were angels. Now, what does the word angel mean? Literally, it means um, messenger of God, bringer of good news, one who brings good news. So in that sense, um, we are all invited to be angels, to be messengers of God, to be bearers of good news like those three visitors in today's story from the Hebrew Bible. In the gospel for today, Mary and Martha welcome Jesus into their home. So you see, not only do we sometimes entertain angels unaware, messengers of God, we also um, welcome God made flesh, welcome Christ into our homes, into our dwelling places, into our sacred spaces. And when we do so, we want to be sure that we do so with full, true welcome and lavish, gracious hospitality. Now, this story of Mary and Martha, who lived in Bethany, um, Mary and Martha were the sisters of Lazarus, the one Jesus raised from the dead. And there are a number of very short little references to this family. And Bible scholars believe that Jesus had a deep friendship with Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus, that there was this mutual love and friendship between Jesus and this these two sisters and their brother. I love that idea to think of them as being friends of Jesus. And Bethany being just two miles outside of Jerusalem, there's these little references where um, when Jesus would travel to Jerusalem where he would spend the night in Bethany. And Bible scholars believe he would spend the night at the home of Martha and Mary. So if they were good friends, we're told in today's gospel that Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. Now, in ancient times, we've learned that when they tell a story, a biblical story, in the New Testament, and there's a number of people mentioned, the first person mentioned is usually the most prominent, important person. So we're told this was Martha and that she welcomed Jesus into her home and was preparing a meal, but we're told that her sister Mary was sitting at Jesus's feet, listening to him. And that is a phrase, to sit at someone's feet is a phrase meaning to be someone's disciple. Um, and a disciple means a learner, a student, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they had disciples, Jesus had disciples who would listen to his teaching, learn from him, but disciples also mean those um, who learn and who also follow. So not only do we want to learn from Jesus in his teaching, we also want to follow in this way of Jesus. So here we have Martha preparing, welcoming Jesus into her home and preparing a meal. And Mary is sitting at Jesus's feet, listening to him. 
And Martha's very distracted, we're told, and says to Jesus, um, Jesus, look at my sister. She's not helping me. Tell her to come help me. She's just sitting there. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you were distracted with many things, but only one thing is truly necessary. Mary has chosen the, the one thing necessary. And so often these two sisters are contrasted and they're seen as polar opposites. In this story, Martha comes out as bad and Mary as good. Well, that's not the case at all. Both are good. <laughs> And, um, and we all have some of each sister within us. Many people say that Mary represents the contemplative life, um, immersing ourselves in scripture and listening to God, prayer, contemplation, receiving this teaching of Christ, whereas Martha represents the active Christian life, serving Christ. Indeed, we need a combination of both sisters, Mary and Martha, to fully follow the way of Jesus, right? The, the student-learner part of discipleship and also the following Jesus in his way of life, the serving part of discipleship. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because in, in early Christian documents that have been found, other uh, writings and gospels that are not in the canon, we learn that later it is in fact Martha and not Mary who becomes a leader in the early Christian movement um, and who continues to welcome people into her home um, with a house church. She becomes a leader, an early Christian leader. So sisters and brothers, um, in our Lutheran Christian tradition, we speak about how God comes to us in many and various ways. But in our Lutheran tradition, we say that kind of the most important ways God comes to us is through what we Lutherans call the means of grace. And in our Lutheran Christian tradition, this is word and sacrament. And like Mary and Martha, they are both um, of ultimate importance. Now, in some churches, word is focused so much. There's sermons that are hours long, and they only they maybe never celebrate the sacrament. They don't have sacraments, or maybe they celebrate it once a year. In other traditions, like the Catholic Church, for example, the sacrament of, is of utmost importance, and they don't really have sermons. They have very brief homilies, and the focus is on the sacramental gifts of the church. Well, in our Lutheran tradition, which of course comes out of Catholicism, we say there always has to be a balance of word and sacrament. Um, listening to Jesus, sitting at his feet, but also sharing that meal together, okay? Um, and so when I went on sabbatical 10, 12 years ago, um, my focus was studying early Christian communities and also modern Christian communities and um, how we have, how we are to focus around, uh, uh, to kind of have at our center this combination of word and sacrament. Now in today's world, Often that might be a very loose definition of word and sacrament. It might be something closer to story and meal. Um, do we gather with others, welcoming them graciously, sharing hospitality of, you know, a meal, breaking bread together, that builds community. And also sharing the stories of our life, God made flesh in us and in our stories. And that too becomes community of faith. When we share food and story, 
word and sacrament, um, then we share the means of grace with others. In my um, street church, Church Beyond the Walls, we talk about um, that we try to follow the radical hospitality of Jesus in feeding others spiritually, physically, and spiritually. And at Church Beyond the Walls, we minister to and with many people experiencing poverty, hunger, and homelessness. So we truly try to be welcoming to all and have this radical hospitality to everyone. And at the end of our Eucharistic meal, we clean everything off the altar and our Eucharistic table becomes a literal table to feed hungry people. So there's this connection, right? So I want to say maybe Martha's um, being off track a little had to do with maybe she should have begun by sitting at Jesus' feet and being fed and nourished with his word, with his teaching, so that she then would have the strength to prepare the, the meal um, for her friend Jesus. Um, in other words, let's start with being fed by God, by Christ, in, through the word and the sacrament, because only through that nourishment and spiritual food then do we have the energy in our own lives to then feed all of the hungers that we're bombarded with in others. I want to end with a reference to our second reading from Colossians, this beautiful reading of Christ as really the cosmic Christ the one who created all things, this powerful image of Jesus, who is our all in all. It says the one in whom all things hold or hang together. But then that reading goes on to speak about how we experience that God through uh, one another in the body of Christ. So sisters and brothers, this day may we truly follow that radical hospitality of Jesus who welcomes all graciously, generously, who feeds all with his very presence. May we receive him first into our hearts, into our lives, that spiritual food and nourishment and strength so that then we have the strength to feed others with our presence, for we are the body of Christ. Amen. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and
And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with blessing and grant us peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.